Ambassadors and Excellencies, Distinguished Guests and Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. Today, I welcome you all to the BIPS Roundtable on Defense Diplomacy, a powerful tool of statecraft. The moderator for today's roundtable is Major General Ene Muniruz Zaman, NDC PSC, President BIPS. And the speakers of today's roundtable are Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhry, Distinguished Fellow at BIPS and former Foreign Advisor to the Government of Bangladesh. The second speaker is Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain, former Ambassador and Distinguished Expert, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Aviation and Aerospace University. Now, I would like to request the moderator to carry on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. And a very warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. We are here to talk about a very important aspect of international relations, that is defense diplomacy. A subject that often lies in the shadows, but plays a pivotal role in shaping security landscape of the nations worldwide. In an increasingly interconnected world, where global challenges and threats transcend borders, defense diplomacy has emerged as an indispensable tool for maintaining peace and stability. It involves the strategic use of the military and security assets, not for aggression, but as instruments of cooperation, collaboration, and conflict resolution. One might question why we need defense diplomacy when traditional diplomacy already exists. The answer lies in understanding the unique nature of the security challenges and how defense diplomacy complements traditional diplomatic efforts. Firstly, defense diplomacy builds mutual trust and confidence amongst nations. It fosters open channels of communication and promotes transparency in military activities, reducing the likelihood of misunderstanding, miscalculation, and accidental escalations. Secondly, defense diplomacy aids in preventing and managing conflicts. Rather than relying solely on the threat of military force, countries can leverage their defense relationships to encourage dialogue, mediation, and peaceful resolution of disputes. Thirdly, defense diplomacy strengthens partnership and alliances a wave of interconnected security relationships enhances collective security, ensuring that nations can come up with each other in terms of crisis. Moreover, defense diplomacy can be a potent tool for promoting non-proliferation and disarmament efforts. Nations can engage in arms control dialogue and collaborate on initiatives to curb the spread of weapons of mass destruction. In recent years, we have witnessed numerous instances where defense diplomacy has played a critical role in diffusing tensions and fostering peace. However, we cannot ignore the challenges that come with defense diplomacy. Sensitive military information must be protected, and nations must navigate the delicate balance between security cooperation and safeguarding national interest. Additionally, some critics also argue that defense diplomacy could be used to further militarize conflicts or support oppressive regimes, highlighting the need for clear ethical guidelines and oversight. To conduct defense diplomacy, some of the suggestions are we must strengthen multilateral forums. Nations should actively participate in regional and global security forum to promote open dialogue, trust building measures, and cooperative security initiatives. We should emphasize on capacity building. We must utilize technological advancements so that nation can embrace the latest development in science and technology in the defense capacity. And we should also promote education and research in all matters of defense capacity building encourage academic institutions and think tanks to conduct research on defense diplomacy. 
In conclusion, I would say that defense diplomacy <coughs> is not a panacea, but it is an essential element in the pursuit of global peace and security. By engaging in meaningful and constructive cooperations, nations can build bridges, resolve conflicts, and lay the groundwork for a safer and a most prosperous world. With that introduction, we shall now go back to our panelists for today, and we have two very eminent speakers who will deliberate on the issue in further detail. The first speaker for this morning is Dr. Iftikhar Ahmed Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, General Munir. Uh, a very good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, broadly speaking, what we call diplomacy is the art of managing any relationship in a sensitive and a tactful manner. It may be both interpersonal and international. We are concerned here with the latter, that is the international. In the sphere of such activity comprises verbal or written communications by agents uh, uh, of states or other societal organizations intended to influence events and obtain outcomes in the international system. Hedley Bull, often seen as the founder of the Anglo-Saxon School of International Relations, incidentally my mentor, had argued that, in this, uh, that the sovereign state is the ultimate social unit in an otherwise anarchical world. That is the current predominant universal wisdom. Accordingly, when the states relate to one another, which they must constantly need to, they use the art of diplomacy as the main instrument of foreign policy to guide their conduct. The age-old custom has been to use for this purpose a group of designated professionals called diplomats who functioned out of institutions generically uh, named foreign officers, reporting to their political masters. Over time, as diplomacy is too, as global linkages <coughs> grew more complex, there was a burgeoning sense that diplomacy is too important to be left to the diplomats. Just as in the wake of the First Great War, the French premier, Georges Clamasson had said, war is too, too important to be left to the generals. The key traits required of diplomats were that they focus on interpersonal skills, communication, <coughs> leadership, conflict resolution, and emotional intelligence to navigate professional interactions. The essential attributes were said to be open and serious O op uh, said to be op uh, open and serious spirit, low ego and equal humor, and the ability to remain calm under pressure. They were usually men in gray or dark suits, or women of similarly indistinguishable attire, all designed to uh, engender a serene monotony. There was another profession in the civic community who were meant to share similar qualities, uh, but with a methodological difference in how to achieve their ends, which were not by friendliness, but by force. That was the military. Their uniforms, the often resplendent, uh, also signaled a modicum of uniformity. Logically, eventually, the endeavors of both these communities, both these uh, professions, in pursuit of goals of their state, became enmeshed. As a result, a co-development in the arena of interstate relationship uh, followed, which was the emergence of what we today call, milit what, what was called military diplomacy. This set of circumstances, activities, was carried out by representatives of the defense 
and security institutions which assisted the pursuit of foreign policy related to their responsibilities. This was different from the aggressive, uh, other aggressive norms of external behavior such as gunboat diplomacy or other coercive means of achieving goals. The personnel belonged to the military, uh, but worked in aid of their civilian colleagues. Their tasks were more specific, gathering and analyzing information on threats and making assessments, promoting cooperation and communication between militaries and defense establishments of other states, supporting arms trade and procurements, and performing ceremonial duties with international count counterparts in embassies, uh, international counterparts. In embassies overseas or abroad, they acted as military attaches or advisors and were the only other embassy personnel who, apart from the ambassador, required an agreement from the host country, thereby giving their activities more precise recognition. Over time, of course, uh, in some countries today, we also have uh, civilian uh, defense advisors, uh, such as uh, by Denmark. The term de defense diplomacy, the subject of discussions today, uh, is related to both the methods of state conduct, which is military diplomacy, as well as the civilian diplomacy. Uh, in international relations. Now, uh, in contemporary times, following the Great War of Europe in, uh, between 1914 and 1918, and the World War of 1935 to 45, as well as the unsettling impact of the Cold War of the decades that followed, uh, there was an uh, interesting conceptualization of a new and positive role of defense-related diplomacy. One was that, on the one hand, there was a felt need to demilitarize international relations to the extent possible. And on the other, to provide a broader perspective to the functions of the armed forces before, uh, beyond their offensive, defensive, and deterrent roles. The result was what was called, in an emerging body of literature, defense diplomacy. If definition is the, in, as logic teaches us, is the explicit state uh, description of the connotation of a term, there is no universally accepted definition of the term defense diplomacy. Here, wh wh what operates is the maxim that to define is to limit. And it is difficult to do so here also because uh, the concept is in constant flux. Uh, forever changing and adjusting to specific circumstances. But for our general conceptualizing, I shall cite some attempts at definition. According to a UK defense ministry review in 1998, uh, the term reflects a peaceful use of defenses in order to achieve positive results in the development of bilateral and multilateral relations with given countries. In this view, defense diplomacy did not include military operations, but promoted other kinds of activities, such as mutual visits of ships and personnel, bilateral meetings and dialogues, and exercises and training. UK researchers, Ecote and E. Forster, defined it as, and I quote, peaceful and non-confrontational use of armed forces and related infrastructures as foreign policy and security tool, unquote. While the concept had a Western origin, there was, there's also been an Asian contribution to its expansion. Two experts from Singapore, where I lived and worked for many years, uh, Tang Si Seng and Bhupinder Singh, gave it a wider connotation by adding the role of managers of defense and military establishments. They saw it as a joint and coordinated application of peaceful initiatives of cooperation between the defense and armed forces leadership to build trust, uh, account, counteract crisis, and resolve 
conflicts, unquote. An Indian perspective was provided by Admiral uh, Sunil Lan Lanba when he, saw, uh, when he saw this as a part of a toolkit, now these words are mine, uh, for India's maritime diplomacy. He saw the naval, uh, role, naval role as a set of actions in consonance with Prime Minister Narendra Modi's vision of Sagar. Now, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the word actually means uh, ocean, but here is used as an acronym. Sagar is used as an acronym for security and growth for all regions, S-A-G-A-R. It would not be out of place at this stage to focus a little on the idea inherent and soft and hard power application of diplomacy by states and at times by also non-state actors. The term soft power, first coined by Professor Joseph Nye uh, in the late 1980s, denotes the persuasive approach to international relations involving the use of social, economic, and cultural influences. Nye argues, argued that the United States uh, could use a non-coercive power to establish itself as a world power using culture and ideology for others to follow its lead. The Chinese lent further substance to the idea by incorporating, as China often does, a Chinese way. Beijing's current 21st century version of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, BRI, is the Chinese soft power path to the fruition of Zhang Meng, as they say in Mandarin, which is the China dream. The flip side of the coin of soft power is hard power. The coercive approach to international relations frequently uh, involving military might. It entails the use of force or the threat to do so in order to make others comply. There are also examples of the same tools, such as economic cloud, being used as both soft and hard power. As soft power when used in the forms of, say, market access or investments, or hard power when used in sanctions. Defense, defense diplomacy is somewhat similar and can be used both to cajole and that failing to coerce. While there is no agreed definition of defense diplomacy, there is a broad consensus that uh, it is an expression of network diplomacy. It links the implementation of foreign policy and objectives to those of the defense sector. By bringing to bear the manif manifold manifestations of both soft and hard power on any given issue, it demonstrates that uh, uh, defense diplomacy, if appropriately conducted, and when not misused as a weapon of political control, can be an invaluable instrument of statecraft, as the title of our discussion today suggests. Nation's peacekeeping operations, in which Bangladesh plays so important a role, are a supremely important instance. Another is how militaries or powerful countries have begun to round off perceptible sharp edges by also responding to sentiments such as gender balance. An excellent example would be, as it now seems very likely, by the appointment as the army chief in the, in the UK of Lieutenant General Sharon uh, Nesmith, a woman. I thank you. Dr. Chaudhary, thank you very much for your excellent laying the foundation of the conceptual understanding of defense diplomacy. I shall now go back to the second speaker for today, Air Vice Marshal Mahmood. And Mahmood, you have the floor now. Mr. Chairman, Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, my co-panelist, Dr. Iftikhar Choudhury, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. First of all, I thank General Munir Zaman for giving me this opportunity to present a brief on the subject of diplomacy, defense diplomacy. 
a powerful tool of statecraft. In fact, diplomacy itself is a very complex issue, a subject, and I will try to focus on the practical aspect of it, the way I understand what defense diplomacy is with the help of the examples. I also feel elated that my co-panelist is none other than Dr. Ifekar Chaudhary, the doyen of diplomacy. I feel deeply honored. Many of his points I might repeat just to drive home the strategic importance of these issues in the context of evolving world order. I shall take about 13 minutes for my presentation. Our international system is anarchical. There is no denying this fact. So states must be able to preserve their national interest. The first task of diplomacy is to reduce the tension of conflict and work for peace. The intent of diplomacy is to promote national interest by peaceful means, and if it ends in war, then it has failed in its mission. Diplomacy is an essential component of a state's foreign policy. The range of foreign policy is very wide. A state's foreign policy objectives must align themselves with its diplomatic skills and intellectual depth. So its diplomacy must determine its objectives in accordance with its actual and potential national power for the pursuit of these objectives. Diplomacy must assess the objectives of other nations and their actual and potential power for the pursuit of their objectives. Diplomacy must determine to what extent these different objectives are compatible with each other. Finally, diplomacy must employ the means suited to the pursuit of its national interests. Failure in one of these tasks, Hans J. Morgenthau, the great political scientist, says, may jeopardize the success of foreign policy and with it the security of the state. But arbitrary advocacy of peace and rejection of war is too naive a theory. We must remember that if peace were the ultimate goal of statecraft, then the solution to the problem of conflict would be easy. Peace may always be achievable by surrender to the aggressor state. The real task for the peaceful state is to struggle for peace that protects and ensures its national interest and its pursuit of national security. Hence, diplomacy is an interface between a state's national interest and the elements of power, namely political, economic, scientific, and military. The sources of diplomacy are rooted in real politic, but its outcomes lie in the hope of liberalism. The power of the military forms the essence of defense diplomacy of a state in its relation with the external world. I consider Singapore model a useful example in setting the perception of the defense for protecting its vital national interests. Singapore's defense diplomacy is based on the twin pillars of deterrence and diplomacy. Singapore, like Bangladesh, lacks strategic depth and is located within a volatile region. This has sensitized its leaders to acquire military power to ensure its security. It has strained bilateral relations with its neighbors. The expansion of its military capabilities allows it to adopt a military doctrine that blends defense diplomacy with deterrence in shaping a strong strategic posture. The diverse uses of military power in responding to strategic coercion, peacekeeping, humanitarian relief operations, and humanitarian intervention signal the growing maturity of Singapore's foreign policy through the overarching diplomatic initiatives. The authoritative Jane World Air Forces describes Singapore's Air Force as the most powerful and capable air arm in Southeast Asia. Confidence in its military capabilities has led Singapore to use counter coercion on occasion when Singapore's troubled relations with Malaysia flares up periodically. Thus avoiding war, Singapore Air Show, a global event for global aerospace industries of 50,000 attendees hosting high-level government and military delegations around the world, is an extraordinary illustration of defense diplomacy. For defense diplomacy to be meaningful, a state must acquire a military's vantage point. The most profound case of defense diplomacy is practiced by the United Nations. The United Nations Peacekeeping Operations is a multilateral mechanism. It fulfills the UN Charter to adopt measures to maintain or restore international peace and security. This multilateral mechanism has recorded several successes despite many failures. 
UN peacekeeping operations are an extension to traditional diplomacy. It has evolved over the years and emerged as a new form of diplomacy. Though peacekeeping operations underscore the differences with traditional dif diplomacy, there is no denying that these operations are an expression of a country's foreign policy. Putting in the context of the post-Cold War era, traditional diplomacy has ceased to be the preoccupation and exclusive business of the foreign ministry and carrier diplomats. It now involves soldiers, sailors, and airmen who are not necessarily diplomats, but act as diplomats in terms of negotiating between warring parties. In doing so, these military personnel carry their country's flags and represent the letter in resolving global conflict and increasingly become the representation of their country's foreign policy objectives. I can also highlight the example of General John McChrystal, who commanded the U.S. forces in Afghanistan. When he was asked about defending the U.S. interests in Afghanistan, his answer was that it is through winning the hearts and minds of the people of the local area that U.S. interests will be best served in Afghanistan. Bangladesh has presented itself to the world as a uniquely edifying example of a guardian of international security by successfully participating in UN peacekeeping operations. Beside its many success stories at state level, Bangladesh has successfully sold its lessons of good practices in consolidating peacekeeping diplomacy across the world. Since 2012, Bangladesh has occupied the first position as two troop contributing country to the United Nations in four years. Peacekeeping is also about winning the hearts and minds of the host country's population, as reflected through the statement previously said of John, John McChrystal. Military then achieves its diplomatic panache through the efforts of its soldiers. There is a country where Bengali is the official language according to their constitution. The country is Sierra Leone. Surprisingly, Bengali-speaking people do not live there. Sierra Leone has given Bengali the official status in recognition of the Bangladeshi peacekeeping force to restore peace in that country. Bengali was announced as the official language of Sierra Leone in 2002. Bangladesh military has proved that it is an important tool of statecraft and it has enormous talent in actualizing the principles of soft power in the arena of international security. The future holds enormous potential as to the challenges and opportunities in defense diplomacy for Bangladesh. The simple reason is that Indo-Pacific as a region will be the focus of geopolitics and geostrategic debates in international relations. The strategic landscape can be summarized in the following essentials of Indo-Pacific diplomacy, which is important for the defense personnel at all levels. First, how China balances itself against the Western powers and their allies led by the United States. Second, how both China and the United States are persuasive in prosecuting Indo-Pacific liberal order. Third, how strong is ASEAN in keeping itself away from taking sides either with China or the United States. Fourth, how forceful is the logic that extra-regional military alliances such as AUKUS has the potential to flare into serious civilizational security dilemma. Fifth, how prudent will China and India be in working together to make Indo-Pacific a zone free from Western influence? And finally, sixth, how integrative is the approach of states and regional institutions in tackling life-threatening irritants such as extremism, hypernationalism, insurgencies, irredentism, maritime piracy, climate catastrophes, disasters, environmental pollution, human and drug trafficking, migration, refugee exodus, and etc. The comprehensive knowledge of these contexts is extremely important for the diplomats in the coming days. The geostrategic location of Bangladesh is unique. It is a confluence of South Asia and Southeast Asia. Bangladesh crowns the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean region. If you look at the context as explored just now, we shall have to conclude that these issues cannot be comprehended only by the tools and officials of the military uh, officers of the foreign ministry officers of the foreign ministry therefore the involvement of the military is expedient because of the resources intelligence and expertise they can bring to the diplomatic initiatives of the states the military diplomats in the embassies should constantly upgrade the heads of the missions on their geo geopolitical assessment of the indo-pacific their briefing must include besides 
non-traditional security threats, a picture of the militarization of the Indo-Pacific space, alliance shifting, overuse of artificial intelligence, spread of radicalization, and the subjects which deal with the higher sciences of warfare so that the superior authority in the foreign ministry can make proper adjustments to their strategic thinking and formulate policies. In fact, defense wing in each embassy is the need of the R. If we see closely the nature in which geopolitical and geostrategic influences of the world politics has shifted toward Asia in recent times. In the past, diplomacy had been the chessboard of the emperors, kings, princes, ministers, and ambassadors extraordinary because it was considered a very high-profile activity reserved for the crown few of the state when the state's existence hung in balance. At least this is what we learned in history after the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Even after the First World War, Woodrow Wilson's 14-point principles, despite being the primus inter pares of collective security, did not register the potential of the military for diplomatic ventures in international peace. The idea that diplomacy should not be the only pay playground of the foreign office and political masters is the result of the United Nations after World War II. The UN peacekeeping operations heralded a new phase to diplomacy in international security through the intervention of the military. In this regard, Henry Kissinger's book, Diplomacy, serves as a unique example for academic uh, understanding of what diplomacy is. Defense diplomacy is now an integral component of foreign office. This is a challenge. The success of a state's diplomacy lies in fusing the moral precepts of the foreign policy with the material capabilities of the military doctrine in guiding the light of its international relations. Thank you. Mamu, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I now have the pleasure to open the floor for your questions and comments. Please feel free to ask any question, either to the whole panel or to individual speakers. The floor is open. Yes. Microphone here. Uh, introduce myself. Yes, yeah, it's on. I introduce myself firstly, I am uh, Lieutenant Colonel McClellan, I'm the DA uh, from the UK. Uh, you touched on a Treaty of Westphalia with the premise that it established international norms and the sovereign nation state. The Treaty of Westphalia, I think, is, is, is not uh, established as well as I think it should do in the United Nations which I think you've possibly touched on. Because what happened there was within Europe itself, uh, established borders, uh, as I've mentioned, international norms, which unfortunately today uh, are still not being observed. And something which I thought would have been touched on was the illegal uh, actions uh, by the invasion and genocide, uh, co war crimes in Ukraine conducted by Russia, which is the greatest threat to the world today. I love your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yes, please. Microphone there. And please introduce yourself when you ask the question. Sure. Hi, I'm Atif Choudhury from the University of South Carolina's Rule of Law Collaborative. Um, I, was, I would love for the panel's um, uh, insights on this. I think a recent trend we've seen, maybe within the last five to eight years, is China's growing role in peacekeeping, You know, primarily in the African continent. But we've seen them deployed in um, Mali and Niger and South Sudan, um, mostly to kind of protect investments. But also, it seems to be a genuine attempt at trying their hand at international peacekeeping. Uh, it's something that the US Institute of Peace and others have been you know, trying to kind of, to, to kind of study in the reporting. Do, do you think that could be kind of a paradigm shift? Do you think there could be any implications for Bangladesh, given Bangladesh's role in peacekeeping? Could there be just kind of any insights that you have on this, I think would be really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Alif. Next question. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Brigadier General Ghani. Uh, I was 
serving as a sector commander in South Sudan in 2005 and 6, and also as defense attache in Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain. From this experience of these two appointments, I like to ask a questions to the panels as well as the, those are here present. As it has been very well said, the, a powerful tool of statecraft. Therefore, from the experience of South Sudan, even peacekeeping mission, it was the first integrated mission where even thought that all components of UN should be together for the peaceful implementation of peace in South Sudan. Since I was at operation level, so we could accumulate the various components and found out the difficulties and also challenges. Same manner in Kuwait, while uh, doing this task, we also saw at embassy level and also, uh, also at state level how we work together with the ambassador and others to implement our national policies. My question is, since two questions, number one is how the uh, defense diplomats can work at embassy level more coherently to implement the national statecraft. Uh, we have some of the ambassadors here, so they will find out the answers maybe. And next question is, at national level in Bangladesh, how this thing is being implemented, integrated approach of defense diplomacy at national level? So uh, I will seek the two answers from you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'll, sorry? I'll just come to you, sir. Rusht, please. Uh, I'm Abu Rusht. I'm the editor of Bangladesh Defense Channel. I have a few questions to uh, Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud, sir. Sir, uh, about defense diplomacy in our region, or especially for Bangladesh, there was a pact signed between Russia and Bangladesh. Nearly, uh, they gave us a $1 billion loan protocol. And uh, against that, we received some some, some sort of, say, ATGM or something like that. And uh, Yak-130 ground attack aircraft, some MI-17 and others. And we also uh, have some, say, loan protocol signed uh, with India, $500 million. But so far, we have received only few uh, Tata, some sort of vehicles like that, not more than that. Maybe there are some uh, say problems or something in between. But what is your opinion about the, this, this deal with Russia? Now, can Bangladesh, can Bangladesh bring some spare parts or have some relationship with the Russian companies? That was a diplomacy, you can say, Russia just pushed aggressively. So far, my knowledge uh, goes, our ATGMs are not all right now. Our EACs, they lack spare parts. So, and you know you are an Air Force officer. And with India, what we'll do with that? We'll go further, we don't know anything. It was a long time back, probably in 2017, we signed something. And then, I have some uh, other things that, uh, if you can remember, that uh, uh, China recognized Bangladesh on 31st August in 1975. And after that, we established a strong military relationship with China. And basically, China helped us to build our armed forces. But now, maybe more than 85% of our military hardware are from China, especially in the uh, Air Force and uh, Navy. Do you think that the, the, the world is changing now? In this scenario, what you have said about IPS and other things, the Western countries uh, in, in one side, in China in one side, we are at the loggerhead. Do you think that over-dependence on China, excessive dependence on China, is hampering some sort of thing in our country to change our system? To, and how we'll cope up with that? This is connected with diplomacy. 
thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, you have the floor. Um, Next question. A very brief question. My name is Sudeep Chakravarti. I'm director of uh, the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. My question is to any of you gentlemen or anybody else who wishes to answer. Um, you conflated, or sort of you mentioned Singapore and Bangladesh in the same breath. Uh, I don't know if it was inspirational in nature or sort of uh, an idea that you put out there, and it's to all of you. Now, is it sort of aspirational in terms of uh, the strategic approach of Singapore, or would you extend it to Singapore's approach of weapon systems, platforms, and alliances as well? I just wanted to get that clarification. In there. Because as the gentleman here said, it's a tricky world now. So. Thank you, Ambassador. Microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, having heard uh, the two lead speakers, Dr. Iftikhar and our Air Vice Marshal, who also served as an ambassador. So he, of course, understood the value of uh, diplomacy and defense. Uh, I will make a small uh, comment first. Uh, you know, defense and diplomacy, these are two separate entities. And uh, there is a symbiotic relation. That's what we have been you know, trying to gauge from you know, quite some time. Any nation which has a good, strong defense you know, uh, instrument in the country, uh, that is recognized. And that, of course, definitely helps the diplomacy. Uh, I, I'm, uh, there has been a bit of reference to Singapore. Uh, I remember when there was this 1964 uh, conflict uh, between Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, I had a very good friend from the defense in Singapore. I, in, I asked him uh, one of those very you know, uh, questions he didn't expect that I would ans ask him. I asked him that, uh, why is Singapore preparing itself as a defense entity? as uh, you know, Mahmoud, Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud mentioned, and even Dr. Iftikhar. The reason he said, you know, uh, the, the Indonesian just walked over Singapore and crossed, and uh, we don't take it uh, so easily. So that, that gave us a realization that our defense has to be developed. And that's why Singapore took interest to develop its defense. So you uh, think that is missing over here, that we are having a uh, small, small concern for our national state, our liberation war is also based on the whole country, you know, um, uniting under some sort of defense strategy. And of course, the diplomacy also played an important role. Otherwise, recognition, you know, so many countries fought war during that period. Uh, Biafra was there, and there was some upheaval in Indonesia also. Uh, that did not materialize. This is the only country, Bangladesh, that became independent after the Second World War, and that many individuals have done their PhDs in this particular area, how this was possible. So the, my question over here, that our diplomats had to play a very lead role. Otherwise, you know, the country by winning the war does not, uh, you know, carry any message to the rest of the world, whether it is to the, the, the British or the American people or the, 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 the Russians or the Chinese or whosoever it could be all over the world. It was our diplomats, they played a leading role. But as situation has evolved and changed, and uh, today we are, I think, connected in various ways. So we know what is going on in each and every areas and uh, specifically. I think we need to, first of all, make sure that we have good, uh, you know, our neighborly relations. That's very important because we don't want to, to get into concern with our neighbors because that's the best of the relationship we should maintain. And that's, I think, one big concern. I think we have, we have we have been talking over here of Indo-Pacific area. Now, Indo-Pacific area is also our neighbor, neighbor neighboring area where uh, our our you know uh, diplomacy has to play a very important role. Uh, that is how we we fit in. Otherwise, our trade and commerce will suffer. Our uh, future interest of the country, our economic diplomacy will suffer. I think this is the concern I have about uh, linking the defense and diplomacy. I think two, these are two separate units. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador. As we heard from the presentations, uh, defense diplomacy is not an independent track. It's a diplomatic activity which complements the traditional diplomacy, which is the core of dipl diplomatic actions. So states can use various tools to complement the basic tool of diplomacy, which is the traditional diplomacy. But increasingly, defense is coming to complement that. Sarwar, you have the floor. Uh, my name is Sarwar Chodhri. I work for the Norwegian Embassy. Uh, actually, my question was partly covered by uh, Aburush sir, but still I will uh, I will try to pinpoint it a little more. Uh, we know that a, a lot of uh, middle power uh, like Bangladesh has got traditional relation, defense cooperation or defense purchase relation with certain countries. So we already know the figures that more than 70% of Bangladesh defense purchases is, is coming from one particular major global power. So uh, now that we have a very good relation, uh, Bangladesh has got a very good relation with a particular major major global power where, where all the armaments are coming. At the same time, how can Bangladesh think about diversifying its uh, sourcing? And so how to balance out these two uh, conflicting aspect of like moving away a little bit from one particular source or one basket and at the same time maintaining the diplomatic good relation. So this, uh, th my, my question would be to Dr. Chaudhry about uh, this, this balancing act of diversifying the sourcing of military armament at the same time maintaining a good relation. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Shamim, sir, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Chairman and Moderator. I think all, too many questions have already been asked. Uh, it's a very interesting and important subject that you have taken up for our deliberation this morning. Uh, what I would like to emphasize here, I think we are not discussing the defense diplomacy as an independent person. I think it has to be a part, although an important component of overall diplomatic relations with the country with which we are also talking in the, in the context of defense diplomacy. Uh, like there are other components like cultural diplomacy, trade diplomacy, so defense diplomacy can, can be a, a component in the overall diplomacy with a particular country where the overarching relation does and should lie in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I have just uh, noted with interest the remarks that were made by the gentleman who is, I think, defense advisor was in Kuwait and somewhere about the functional uh, problems that we have in the embassy between uh, the let's say the diplomatic wing or the political wing and the defense wing. But in view of the presence of a large cross-section of people here, I think this matter could have been very effectively addressed in some kind of a brainstorming session that you could hold in your office because I, as head of mission in two stations, have some experience on this and really I could have made some observation on that. But I would leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Najibur Rahman. I was the former principal secretary and now I'm managing a fund as, as its chairman. Uh, it's a very enlightening session and it's always, I would say, uh, pleasing to hear uh, Dr. Iftikhar Choudhury uh, making his, his viewpoints on, on different issues. Uh, thank you, sir. And also, um, uh, my good friend, uh, Abbas Masal Mahmoud Hussain has made a very important, important presentation. I'm, I'm echoing the sentiments uh, from the floor uh, colleagues uh, and elders who are, who are voicing their concern that let's not uh, in any way create an environment where diplomacy and defense becoming confrontational because they are both of them are, are participatory and complementary in, 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 in the way they they, they proceed. Uh, and also to recognize that diplomacy is the political prerogative. Uh, as Truman said, I made my foreign policy. I made my uh, my my diplomacy. I have worked with uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina and she does that. She is the architect of Bangladesh foreign policy. And uh, as I am uh, referring to the issue of uh, defense diplomacy in the neighborhood, you know, you remember that when there was time there were tensions between
get you another one. So there were uh, there were tension between in the in the in the neighbors in the eastern neighbor with with Myanmar, and there were some very uh, serious vibration in the in the in the defense sector. She promptly uh, handled that, advised all concerned to not to be in a retaliatory mood, but remain engaged with diplomacy, and 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 sort out the problem peacefully. Because in a country like ours, which is focusing on Poverty and poverty alleviation, and and the general development of the country that was very important. If you are engaging in a conflict, the cost is very heavy. So I think this is another point that you have to uh, in discussing this topic, you have to underline the the supremacy of supremacy of the of the political leadership. I think unfortunately this issue was not mentioned uh, in this discussion. Maybe the um, because of the time constraint, but. Uh, I, I worked in two missions where there were diplomatic uh, diplomatic entities, two defense advisors in Myanmar. I was the, uh, I, I used to call myself deputy head of mission because I was the only uh, other diplomat than the ambassador. I was the first secretary and there was a brigadier who was in charge of the defense wing. But there was that norms that when the ambassador is away, it's not the defense personnel who heads the mission. It's the only other diplomatic person who will head the mission. So this is also Ambassador, I, think I wanted to know that does it still exist and what was the norm behind this? And not undermining the area of defense diplomacy. I'm, I'm very uh, impressed the way the defense forces interact with each other. But uh, as one of our uh, ambassador rightly pointed out that the more powerful your your defense forces is, you get an extra edge over over any kind of diplomacy, be it cultural, social, economic, polit political. So this is this is a very complex area, but uh, as I always admire Bips uh, for introducing such very delicate topics so simply and mobilizing such an uh, very very proficient and eloquent speakers for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I once again mention that the core diplomacy lies with the Foreign Office. All other tools of diplomacy, be it cultural, be it defense, be it sports, be it other elements of soft power, they all complement to the Foreign Office, which remains the core of the diplomacy of the country. And all actors, all state actors, act on the guidance of the political masters. So this is established, and that's how democracies work. And that's exactly how things operate in a democracy. Next question. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself before you ask the question. Hi, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I am Salva, I'm political advisor at the Embassy of Denmark and also looking at maritime affairs um, for the embassy. So my question also kind of treads into area of economy here. So we know that Bangladesh is engaging more and more in blue economy. Um, for instance, Denmark has proposed exclusivity in the Bay of Bengal for offshore wind energy, and the proposal has been already sent to the PMO's office. Um, so I just want to know how important is defense diplomacy in addressing maritime security? looking at the fact that there will be more and more engagement of Bangladesh and trying to make most use of um, its international and territorial waters. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, Ambassador, please. Good morning, everyone. I am the ambassador of the Philippines here in Dhaka. Uh, on my way up to ambassadorship, along the road, there were, there were a lot of things that have made me happy. But uh, there, are only a, there are also a few things that make me sad. One of these things that make me sad is, is, is this. One of the basic things I learned when I was in the primary school is good fences make good neighbors. However, along the way to my ambassadorship, as I further studied international relations, 
theorists, states, governments, and politicians, as well as military men, have complicated the so-called fences, good fences make good neighbors. With, I referred to this personally, good fences make good neighbors as the diplomacy of the fence. So my question is, is it really too late for us these days to go back to this so-called diplomacy of the fence rather than just uh, uh, develop defense diplomacy? That's the question. To anyone who would wish to re respond to that. Thank you, Ambassador. Is there any other question before we close the session for questions? All right, if there are no other questions, we'll now go back to our panelists for them to respond to your questions and give their end thoughts. Dr. Chaudhary, you have the floor now. Can I have something to speak to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I uh, just say one thing uh, initially, because uh, what I did today was to lay, uh, lay out the conceptualization of, of what we has been termed defense diplomacy. Now, uh, mind you, one can't carry this too far, this, uh, uh, this distinct, uh, distinctions. I mean, these are not uh, intellectual silos. Uh, these are offshoots of extant or existing literature on a particular topic. Like diplomacy came from international relations. We have uh, ambassadors here have spoken of, uh, Shamim has spoken of cultural diplomacy. You have spoken of economic diplomacy. There have been all kinds of sort of sub uh, areas of diplomacy which have emerged in literature. This is one such. It is not a silo by itself and therefore at some point in time, one must not be surprised if uh, uh, thinkers come up with the concept of, and they certainly will, in integrated approach to diplomacy. Again, bring everything together into one. So eventually, these, these are uh, 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 academic uh, conceptualization of certain sets of activities of states, which for, for the reasons of better capacity for research, are put together and described, uh, given a definition and described conceptually. So it assists uh, uh, principally research and also inspires uh, 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 creative thinking. But at the end of it all, there is a grand design of which it forms a part. And in this way, uh, 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 defense diplomacy is part of, as I said, an extension of military diplomacy and also a part of, as, uh, uh, as uh, General Munir was saying, uh, complements traditional diplomacy. All that is a part of the whole methodologies by which states, or even today non-state actors, interact with one another in the international scene. So, I mean, we must not carry this, these distinctions too far. Now I'll react to some specific uh, questions uh, to which I think uh, I, I, I have some ideas on on on, on what uh, uh, would be an intelligent uh, reaction as to procurements. I mean, I think it was Saro who asked about procurements, uh, how to sort of uh, uh, balance procurements. The, par the purpose of procurements may actually also be just price and compatibility with existing weapons. I mean, uh, uh, Pakistan does a very very careful this thing of procurements, Pakistan procures from Iran, pa sorry, uh, uh, China, as well as the United States. And, and they do it in a very balanced kind of way uh, uh, in which to take care of broad foreign policy principles as well as costs and compatibility. Uh, secondly, a point that Nassim Ghani, uh, General Ghani, uh, Nassim, uh, the, yeah, you raise a very important point, but which, uh, as, uh, as uh, 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 you were saying, Najib, should be part of separate discussions. This is not confrontational between diplomacy and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, defense, uh, defense strategies, but a part of the integrated governmental approach to these ideas. In the missions, of course, it largely, I would say, I've also headed missions myself, uh, it, this depends on the, the, the ability, capacity of the mission management. Mission management, which is the, I would assume, the ambassador and the deputy ambassador, whatever you call it, uh, to, to uh, uh, 
somehow synergize your own uh, uh, representatives of various uh, ministries within your system to work together and also in line with the general ideas and instructions you get from the headquarters. I mean, we have heard of foreign offices, but everybody knows that uh, ambassadors receive their instructions, not just from the foreign offices, but from many uh, areas of governance and other uh, departments, et cetera, at home. But it is, again, diplomacy at home for the foreign office to integrate these into a proper uh, 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 fruition of policies uh, enunciated by prime minister or president, whatever the case may be. Now, second, uh, so this, this is one thing. Uh, then the role of the ambassador. Now, ambassador is not necessarily an, is not an officer. An ambassador is a representative of the flag. Ambassador is representative of the state. Uh, uh, so the ambassador's uh, role, it, it, Broadly, it can be ceremonial, and yet it has to be very functional in, in, in the present day because we can't waste resources on an office which is so so costly. At the same time, would not be able to do anything. So the role has evolved. It, role has evolved, and it is a very tricky job, of course, to manage your uh, the different segments of gov government in your own system and also relate to, to the whole base. But a uh, better. I mean, everything is subject to tests and evolution. We are all trying to evolve here in Bangladesh as well. The way we handle, for example, peacekeeping, we have an AFD with the Prime Minister's Prime Minister's Office, which works in very closely with, with, with the Foreign Office, and certainly very closely with the field when I was permanent representative. Uh, I worked very closely with both the AFD and, in fact, the, the chief of the uh, 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 chief of staff of the army. So it's a question of uh, uh, f uh, functional adjustments of how you operate your responsibilities. And that is the, the test of governance of a government is, is to be able to integrate all these uh, uh, different functions into one uh, part of a integrated policy towards the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah Chaudhary. Mahmoud? Thank you, sir. I'll just uh, respond to the particular questioners. First, uh, Colonel Meckel, you cited the example of peace of Westphalia. It was in 1648, after the 30 years of war, and um, entire Europe was bloodshed into decimation. After that, in 1815, we had concert of Europe, right? Then in 1915, 19, we had after the First World War, the League of Nations, and after the Second World War, we know that the United Nations came into it. In all these processes, the norms were there, rules were established, institutions were developed. But still, two things were never compromised. One is the nation state system, and the second one is the necessary nation state system, means you must have a border. And the second one, for the protection of the border, you must have an standing army. Okay, whenever you have the standing army or force, then your responsibility is to defend your country in the interest of its existence. Clear. Now, what has happened in Ukraine? Uh, say, for example, it is more historical, more cultural, but you will get different connotations from different people. What Putin thinks, probably Biden would not be thinking in the same manner. That's why it has happened. Okay, now the responsibility of the great leaders if we take Biden to be the greatest leader in the current context, coming from the United States of America, his responsibility is to understand diplomatically which country would be more suited in creating a balance in this context. It has happened previously also. The third party leaders were brought in and then the balance was created. We have heard about Matanik, we have Talleyrand, we have heard about Castle because of their contribution in bringing about a settlement which they feel that enormously is damaging for the peace and stability of the region. So this is my answer to you. We may be able to find out a solution to this, may not be today, but say for example after, after, after two or three months or after even two years, there will be a solution to it. Nobody realized when Field Marshal Alfred von Schlieffen made the plan, the war will exceed from 46 days to six years, the First World War. So, I mean, future cannot be predicted. This is a case of probability. Second one, Professor Altaf Chaudhary from the United States of America. 
Ah, yes. We wish Atif Chaudhary. Atif Chaudhary. Uh, sir, China will obviously play a growing role. There will be a paradigm shift, but this paradigm shift should also be accepted in the context of peacekeeping among peace enforcement, right? Because as a nation, if you are powerful enough, you can contribute also more. Why is it that the United States of America has got so much of telling in the decision making of the United Nations? It is only because United States probably contributes the highest, close to about 22 or 23 percent of the uh, UN budget. So they will have a say. But we have to accept the realism of diplomacy. Clear. Third question, Brigadier General Ghani, a powerful, but all the components you want, the, how they can come closer together. Now, my personal opinion is that in the context of Bangladesh, to be more pragmatic, we should work together, especially foreign office officers and military officers, closer more and more. This is happening. Otherwise, there would not have been so many peacekeeping missions in which we have participated. It's primarily because of the contribution made by the foreign office officers. But there are two very unique places where we can practice this. One is your staff college. The other one is your national defense college. We can start playing diplomatic game. Exercises, hardly we have done so. So there could be courses also. How do you, uh, I mean, bring about the problems in case of uh, a serious issue and how do you diplomatically solve it with the help of both the components of military and the foreign office, right? Clear. AFD is there, but I think uh, even as an ambassador, I find that uh, sometimes there was a gap between the ambassador and the officer who was working as the defense advisor in the defense wing. My personal opinion, if you ask me, the uh, defense advisor or military attaché, whoever it is, he should completely come under the command and control of the ambassador or high commissioner instead of having a second line open through military channels. This is where the conflict grows. Am I right? Okay. Fourth question was, uh, I think the fourth question was similar to the third one. How the different diplomats, how the defense diplomats more co Achha, defense diplomats can more coherently work with such Shamim said uh, probably it was your question. I've given an example of this, given a pragmatic uh, recommendation to this. Our responsibility is to inform the foreign office more and more, even if I'm wearing the uniform. In fact, this is where uh, I have said in constantly they should be in touch with the foreign ministry, the ambassador and the high commission. Instead of that, what happens probably we are giving, I mean, intelligence reports to, 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 to the DGFI and the intelligence organizations, instead of making my ambassador high commissioner aware of the situation, what is it is like? I can give you 100% guarantee there is so much of literature available with probably defense uh, advisors or military attaches in different embassies or high commissions. Hardly they do recognize the importance of, 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 of enlightening their ambassadors, high commissioners on these strategic issues. This should be made a rule and norm. And this should also be made a rule and norm that any ambassador who has served abroad for three years, say China, in there, 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 he should come back and give a lecture to the students of staff college or defense, national defense college. We do not do this. As a result, largely whatever we do, a study in these colleges are highly theoretical. Then the question was from Abu Rushd. Uh, he talked about Russia and India, loan protocol we have signed with Russia. Then again, we have signed the loan protocol with India. Now, the problem with loan protocol is that this is my personal opinion. I think I'm 100% whenever we want to buy certain equipment, the government should always take the specialist or expert opinion of the military officers. If you do not take the opinion of the military officers, specialist ones, then ultimately at the end what happens, there is a gap. And that serious gap is never redeemed, I can tell you. Uh, it was Samuel P. Huntington, he wrote a very wonderful book, The Soldier and the State, in which he says the responsibility of the marshals, generals, and admirals 
is to bring in the specialized knowledge on the field of their political masters. But at the end, it is the political masters whom they should listen. Clear? It can be both way, depending on how much of what you call it, acumen you have used of your intellectual perspective. Like say, for example, in 1971 war, we all know that Prime Minister Indira Gandhi called in Field Marshal Manik Shah and asked him, I mean, why don't you want to start the war now at this moment? Then Manik Shah gave a very good reply that if you go for a war, then the amount of casualty that we'll have, have you ever imagined? And if you go during the dry season, then we can just wrap up the war in about 15 days. Hundred percent guarantee I can give you, and he also made a little bit of fun because both of them had very long noses. He brings his nose closer to the nose of Prime. See, she is also listening to her journal, isn't it? Now, the similar case, in fact, happened uh, in case of uh, say, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what is his name? During the case of David Petrius, okay, he wanted, in fact, a very peaceful solution in Afghanistan, which was contrary to that of McChrystal. So, but at the end, they all had to listen to their political masters. There was no choice. And ultimately, if you fail in bringing about the peace, you have to accept that kind of failure also. And, and about the loan protocol, I always say that uh, it is always better to keep. Uh, all the baskets open so that in case uh, you are in problem, you do not fall short of uh, translating your capabilities into reality. Remember, there is no point having equipment, ships, aircraft, this and that, unless and otherwise we have the bullets or bombs or missiles to fire from them. We can have a large number of fleet, we can have, I mean, two million soldiers, but if the soldiers do not possess weapon, and even after possessing weapons, they do not possess bullets, then it is no point. Okay, that's why you have always seen there in advanced country, there is so much of, so much of pressure or what you call it, intensification of translating your physical power into your mental panache. Like say, for example, these days they are giving more and more emphasis on artificial intelligence, knowing about computers, like uh, BVR, I mean, you want to attack an aircraft, we do not, in fact, uh, fight that aircraft at closer distance, which we call dogfight. You should be able to hit that aircraft off the sky through your VR, I mean, components beyond visual range. Those things like that. So anytime, it is always good for the political masters to listen to the military experts what kind of equipment with whom they should sign the protocol, loan protocol, and what effect it will have ultimately on their military capabilities. Because at the end of the day, your military capabilities are also your material abilities in enhancing or in promoting your deterrence. Uh, so over-dependence on China to an extent, over-dependence on Russia also to an extent, I would say has cost us a little bit, okay, in terms of our deterrence capabilities. And Shudeep Chakravarti, uh, sir, you you asked me a question. Are you the Shudeep Chakravarti, the writer of We the Bengalis? Yes. Oh, very good. Okay. Then you wrote on the uh, issue also about the 19, uh, 1757… Uh, <laughs> incident also. Now, I have always admired Singapore. Why I have admired Singapore? There is also, I mean, pragmatic reason to it. I was the chairman Civil Aviation Authority of Bangladesh. Imagine, Singapore, we always say that a small country. Singapore is not a small country. In aviation, probably they are the leaders in the world. In aviation. And if I tell you, if there is war between Singapore and the rest of the ASEAN countries, it will be difficult to beat Singapore because their military capabilities are so high, not in terms of manpower, but when you combine the manpower and the technology, how they have used technology in the interest of their nations to promote their defense. They have two concepts. One is defense. The other one is deterrence. Okay, we have the defense, but where is our deterrence? That is, their one is ingrained nationally, in fact, deterrence policy. 
And the third one is that our foreign policy is that we should not become an ally of any country. So without becoming an ally of any country, we can always emulate Singaporean example through the building up of competence level of the officers and the soldiers. You know, sir, how difficult in Singapore to become a general. Extremely difficult, in fact. I mean, the promotion policy is so tough and you'll be surprised that the chief of air staff is just about 42 or 43 years age of uh, men who has shown to that rank only by virtue of his both mental faculty and his physical stamina. So if Bangladesh can also be one of those countries emulating, I mean Singapore. The other thing is that I say that uh, wherever people are in fact little apprehensive of talking about India, it is not so kintu. We should not be apprehensive of India. There's no reason. But so far their military is concerned. There are good lessons that you can learn from the from the Indian military. And the the particular the particular area that I would say that in which we should always take India as an example is the intellectual enlightened faculty of the Indian officers. I have done courses with them. Indian Air Force officers, especially with whom I did the course, some of them, they are exceptionally good in two subjects. One is your math, the other one is I'm talking about the Air Force officers since I have done the courses with them and in the knowledge of their, uh, I mean, science. And we do much lag behind them. So there is always something that you should always can pick up uh, from the other forces and then emulate them. Then Shahid Akhtar said, I have said sir, diplomacy, uh, defense and diplomacy, uh, this sometimes becomes unnecessarily bitter in fact diplomacy is diplomacy this is an overarching umbrella in fact under which we have the subsets of defense diplomacy cultural diplomacy economic diplomacy why does it happen it happens primarily because defense diplomacy deals with strategic issues and uh, when it comes to the strategic issues it also tells you something about the conflicting relationship that you have with your neighbors or in international relations. It was uh, Henry Kissinger who also was extremely aggrieved because he said that uh, the number of officers, the staff in uh, State Department was much lesser than the number of officers staff in the Defense Department. And that's why the true contribution of the State Department was not recognized. This is somewhat I mean, uh, cultural, I would say. But otherwise, you see everywhere, starting from peace of Westphalia, all the diplomatic initiatives which were taken at the higher level were by the diplomats. And those these diplomats were also, um, political masters were also your diplomats. Okay, it is like that. So uh, that's why I always say that when we talk about defense diplomacy, we must get our foreign ministry involved very very what you call it integratively and uh, Sunvern not from the Norwegian defense but so you talked about yes this I have already replied that we must have diversification even with Norway maritime diplomacy is so important in fact that we have seen in a, a number of in a number of seminars being held on the advancement of blue economy in the context of Bangladesh Ambassador Shamim sir, I have, I have set a separate paragraph here in my, I think probably uh, you have missed it out, where I said that it is the responsibility of the military to inform the foreign office about the strategic issues and also the responsibility of the foreign office. I said, the solution is very simple. You have courses in staff college or in our foreign office also, or foreign office academy or NDC and we play. We call, in case of what, I mean, uh, when we, uh, we play war gaming, we do the war gaming. Here we will be doing the defense gaming, in fact, by the name of creating a situation and then setting up a uh, scenario and trying to find out the solutions, both from the military officers and the uh, foreign office students. And Nojib sir, you have rightly said, like, I will again quote, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, Samuel P. Huntington, the generals, the air marshals, 
or say for admirals, they should bring in their specialized knowledge to the table of the prime minister or head of the state. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, they must accept what decision they give. And in accepting that decision, they in fact hold the higher ideals of statehood. Otherwise, there will always be a conflict between the political masters and the military commanders, which is not in the interest of a nation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You wanted to say something? No, just, just on two, two, two points which, uh, which uh, were raised further after my remarks. Uh, uh, one is, of course, the Treaty of Westphalia that Colonel you raised and, and uh, also the Air Marshal uh, responded to. Uh, it's a very, very important frame of reference, of course, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, but we also have to recognize that it's evolving. Treaty of Westphalia is really an idea. Uh, uh, um, and since 1648, so much has happened around the world that we have uh, sort of constantly doctored uh, the concepts around the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, however, uh, it is almost certain that the states will rem remain the principal uh, unit or uh, unit of human uh, uh, civic uh, uh, cooperation or uh, uh, principal civic entity. Uh, organizations like the United Nations will forever be eroding in, around this con uh, th those concepts, but this will be a constant flux. Uh, we, we, uh, w much has been said about Singapore for some reason. Well, I I've spent about 15 years as, as a professor in Singapore, and uh, I might tell you that it is actually the ultimate in example of public coherence, the way Singapore makes its, uh, its, its policies. Uh, its Air Force, by the way, is too sp small for it to even locate it. its Air Force in Singapore. It's in Australia and Canada and, uh, and pl places Texas. like that. Yes, te Texas. So, so it's, it's uh, impossibly efficient. Uh, so it's an extremely difficult example to emulate, uh, but uh, a, a good frame of aspiration. <laughs> so that's all I can say about Singapore. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, well, the art of uh, defense diplomacy and the technique of defense diplomacy is evolving. This is an art that needs to be understood well by all nations. Bangladesh uh, is positioned very well because we've got all the right tools in our hand to implement for an effective implementation of defense diplomacy to complement the foreign office. We are the largest peacekeeper. We are a training provider of higher training to many armies and navies. We have exchange visits. We are in the art of military sports. So we have got all the tools that we need to play with the tools of defense diplomacy. And I'm sure, as Dr. Chaudhary did mention, that the art is to integrate all so that ultimately we serve the nation. And in defense diplomacy is to complement the diplomatic tool of the state, which is the foreign office. It has been a very rich discussion. I thank you all for being here. And please join me in thanking our panelists for their wonderful presentations. I will request you again to be with us next month for another round of interesting discussion. And please join us for a cup of coffee outside.